Okay, so you see we're going for a long period. It's like 2,363 years. You do some quick arithmetic. You can notice. Uh, and we, we have a long list of things we're going to go through. I'm not going to read this list to you now because we'll go through it gradually. So, the first question that we should address is what should be included in the theory of communication? It's not self-evident. If we start by looking at the word communication, it turns out that this is actually not an extremely old word. It's not like a language, for example, which you would find maybe 3,000, 4,000 years ago. If we look at communication, it seems like the first time this word appeared uh, was in the uh, 13th, 14th century. Uh, and it is derived from a Latin word, Latin verb, communicare which means to share, to make common, okay? And this in turn comes from a Latin adjective, meaning something that is common or shared locally. So what are we sharing now? We're sharing information, sharing understanding. That's the essence of communication, you might say. So that was there uh, right from the start. But as, you, as I said, it's fairly, the, the, actually the term used in this way is 15th century, where it also meant sharing in general, so you could perhaps communicate a cake with people. Okay, not just information, but as time went on, it became specialized from cakes to information, you might say. Uh, Okay, and th this became strengthened uh, so that the development away from cakes to towards understanding information takes place, let's say, in the 1800s, 19th century, especially in America, but also to some extent in England. <coughs> so that's the term communication. As we can see, it's really not more than about five, six hundred years old. What about the academic discipline of communication? Well, that's even younger, a lot younger, almost 10 times as young. <laughs> so here we are talking about an academic discipline which appears maybe the first time in 1947. So that's only, what, 66 years ago. Uh, so that's not so long, and it was coined by uh, somebody called Wilbur Schramm at the University of Illinois, Urbana. Okay, so, but talking about the term and how long it's been around as, as the official name of, of an academic discipline is not the same thing as talking about whether the subject matter, the topic of communication has been studied or, and how long it has been studied. In fact, if we go back 2,000 years to uh, antiquity, uh, that is 500 years before Christ, uh, we'll find that people were studying what we are calling communication, but under other names, for example, philosophy or linguistics, so on. So actually the study of topics which are relevant for communication is much older but recognizing the study of communication as an academic discipline is fairly young everybody understand the difference yeah so we're going to look at things that we today regard as relevant for studies in communication we're not going to just look at what has happened after 1947. We're going to go back to antiquity and look at theories which deal with communication, even if they did not use that name.
So, let me start by warming you up. In which disciplines do you think that communication is studied today? Rhetoric. Rhetoric? Is that its own discipline in some places it is? It can be. It can be. Definitely yes. What else? Psychology. Psychology. What do they do there? They study thinking. And how cognitive do they? processes. They study cognitive processes when you interact with other people. So that becomes some, something like communication. Yes. A lot of uh, communication relevant studies come from psychology. What else? Pedagogy. Pedagogy, teaching, education. Yeah, and that's communication in the classroom then, especially. Medicine. Medicine, and what do they study? Medicine, but in two ways, I think, like how to communicate with patients, yeah. or how to send the information for patient as a reflex to bigger part of population, like go and vaccine, you know, because this is good for you. Right. So actually, medicine and pedagogy are somewhat similar. They're studying communication in a special circumstance. Classroom, pedagogy, medicine, when you communicate with patients. Or preventive. Or pre yeah. So that's something relevant to the, not actually, you could have been answered in a different way. So I was waiting to hear what you were going to say. You could have said they're looking at the biological mechanisms underlying uh, communication, but you didn't say that. <laughs> you could have said that. <laughs> yeah. What else? Politics. What? Politics. Politics. And what do they study? They have to convince the people. How to convince the people? Is this a sub-discipline of rhetoric? <laughs> could be. Could be. Yeah, or, or they could study not so much how to convince the people, but how people have used language and communication to dominate ideologically or other topics of that sort. Yeah, that, that's, what, yeah that's right. What else? Journalism. Journalism, yes. It's another special purpose, you might say, like pedagogy and, and medicine. Yeah? I agree. What else? Anthropology. Anthropology. And what do they study? I think they associate the human being with their social activities and in which communication is the more important part. Yeah. So and they also look at whether our habits of communicating are different in different cultures. So intercultural or cross-cultural comparison, intercultural communication, stuff like that are of interest to anthropologists. Yeah? Anything else? Phonetic in some way. Phonetics? Yes. Yeah? That's a, as we were talking about last when I met you last time. <coughs> special uh, part of linguistics uh, concerned with the uh, speech sounds. And that's definitely a very important part of communication studies, I agree. Yeah? Sociology. Sociology. And what do they study that is relevant for communication? Um, almost everything. Everything? Yeah. Everything in sociology or everything in communication? in sociology and uh, <coughs> So and when, they in, and when they study income distributions between the poor and the rich, how is that communication? It's, a communica it's definitely a communication between the poor and the rich. Is and, it? Uh, and Maybe you, you get your money in secret and you never show the poor people that you're having money. I'm not um, convinced. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not everything in sociology, but I think there are definitely parts of sociology which are, which are relevant to communication. We should not. We should not let communication swallow, you know, all other disciplines. It's not. That's not completely correct. <laughs> yeah. What else? <coughs> Anything else? Yeah. Cognitive science and artificial intelligence. Yeah. And how does that relate to communication, then? Cognitive uh, science. I want the cognition. What happens when two people communicate? So it's very similar to psychology. Yeah, in a way, but maybe. Uh, they go kind of more deeper than psychology, what happens in the mind and the, what happens in the processes of the uh, mind, actually. If I represent cognitive science, I'm very happy to hear you say that. But if I represent psychology, what do you think I would say? 
psychologists tend to uh, about the attitudes and the behavior, but cognitive science is more or less like in the minds of the people. Do you think the, all psychologists would agree to that? No, no they wouldn't. <laughs> no, they wouldn't. Maybe neuroscience. Maybe, I mean, but, you know, actually psyche means the mind, so uh, it depends. Psychology is somewhat older as an academic discipline than communication studies, so they have had several schools. Some of the schools were not so much in favor of studying the mind, they were more in favor of studying beha behavior, and they were called behaviorist. But that school is no longer so dominant, and now they're back to studying the mind, so I think there, there will be an interesting discussion between cognitive science and psychology about who is contributing what. Yeah? Yeah? Business administration? Business administration, yes. And why, how does that bring in communication? How you organize organization? Yeah. Communication? Yes. How they are Yes. Yeah, so we can say that business administration in a sense is similar to pedagogy and medicine in having journalism, in having a special use of communication in mind and having special interest for that. Yeah? Yeah? There are many hands there, first hand. Okay. Yes? Uh, maybe in some arts, could it be like, for example, theater or, or choreography? Yeah. When you use body language to. So yeah. Something, some message that you're saying. You want to communicate with the audience. Yeah. If you're dancing ballet, or you're singing opera, you want to do it the right way so that the audience is affected. In a wide sense, it's related to rhetoric, you might say. Yeah. And I, red shirt, yes? Yeah. This might relate to what she said. Um, I was thinking of photography. Photography? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could take it as a message, obviously. Sure, sure. And yeah. the way body language and yeah, yeah, yeah. compositional elements. Yeah. I agree. Film, you might add on there. If you do photography, you can do film also. Yeah. And then we have, yeah? Yes? Linguistics in general. Wonderful. <laughs> I'm a professor of linguistics. <laughs> that's, that's why I became interested in communication. So, human language is maybe the most important means for human beings to communicate. So, it's very, very closely related. Yeah, I'm glad. I think this is good for you to see how broad actually communication is and how it can come into many other academic fields and this will also give you an understanding for why sometimes when you see lists or bibliographies for communication studies they will come from, from many different disciplines. This, this area is interdisciplinary and that's good and that's bad. <coughs> it means we have a lot to cover. And um, that could be hard work. Good is that we get communication covered from many different perspectives and aspects. Yeah. Okay, now you'll see my list. I don't think it was as long as the list we just made here. Let's see. Ah, philosophy. No, nobody mentioned philosophy yeah, here. Because you did do <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay. Uh, linguistics, psychology, sociology, business, anthropology, biology, well, we, we talked about medicine in a wide sense, yeah. Computer science, well, we had artificial intelligence, but computer science in general is very much interested in communication nowadays because, well, they provide the means that we make use of in studying various aspects of communication. For example, in artificial intelligence, where we model artificially how human beings are when they communicate. What about physics? Well, Nobody mentioned physics. Well, we said phonetics, and in phonetic field it's connected. Yeah, you're right. Phonetics makes use of a small part of physics. But there could be other parts too that could be made. Telecommunication, and that's actually a, an academic discipline. Sometimes when we announce jobs here, we get a lot of applications from people who are doing telecommunication. And we then have to write and say, sorry, uh, actually we had in mind something else. We were sort of more interested in interpersonal <laughs> communication. <laughs> but the word communication is used a lot by people who are in telecommunication. So, we will be concerned with 
the subject matter of communication, as you can see, in many different disciplines. Okay, what about historical influence? We're going to go back to about 300 years BC. What about those theories that uh, people thought of them? Are they old-fashioned now? Can we throw them away? No? No. No. Depends. Here's, here we hear no over here, and here we hear depends. So why do you say no? I think the old uh, theory, they, also, they give some gloom, some days yeah. for the theories that we have now. Yeah. So we can base our knowledge on what was before, but yeah. if they change with some time, and we cannot just throw away this. No. We must to know and see the difference, how it changed with time, culture, needs. And what you said, it depends. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I thought now that in, if you look at this like process of uh, developing the subject, of course, everything, I guess, important, so, yeah, I changed my mind. You changed your mind, so you're over on this side now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In fact, you will see that some of the theories that were developed more than 2,000 years ago are surprisingly good, and they are still quite valid. We'll soon see. So, no, we're not going to throw them away. Actually, we're going to learn them again, if you haven't learned them already. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, one thing we have to keep in mind when we look at the theories is if we have, whether we have a normative or a descriptive point of view. Okay, it's important to keep those two aspects apart. So if we have a normative point of view, we are interested in how should we communicate? How should you convince people of your own political ideology? Okay, that's one question. And if you want to become business consultants in communication, how many people want to become consultants in communication when you finish this? So at least we have 10, 15. Okay, you're going to be concerned with this how should you do it you know, to, in order to be successful? That's the normative question. The descriptive question is, well, we know how you should do it, but how did they actually do it? So you have this political leader who we sent out, and he was going to give a, a speech that was going to convince everybody of his way of, or her way of doing things. But what actually happened? It fell flat. Because they were not able to really live up to the normative expectations. So if you study what people actually do, and you don't worry at all about how they should do it, then you have a descriptive study. So you might say in science, the descriptive point of view is more basic. You want to find out what people naturally do, rather than their ideas in the first place about what they should do. Because if we know what they naturally do, it's easier for us to give, if we want to do that, give recommendations for what they should do because then we know what the natural basis for our recommendations is going to be. Okay, so usually we regard the descriptive study, how we actually communicate, as more basic than the normative study. Giving people advice about what you should do. But as we go back now to the theories, the different people who have had ideas about communication, have not always made this clear. They sometimes mix them up. Actually, very often they mix them up. So you don't know if they are saying something about what we should do or what they think we actually do. But you should keep this in the back of your mind. Okay, and what, what we're interested in is that we are trying to go towards theories. And what's the difference between a theory and a description? Anybody? What's the difference between a theory and a description? Yeah? A theory is an abstraction of reality. And is the description not? Not in the same way, it's not as detailed. Not in the same way, but it's also a description. It's more specific, perhaps, and theories tend to become a little more abstract. Well, a theory is actually a working mechanism. If you think about it, a description is not. The description is basically telling you what's on the surface, while well, a theory goes in depth. Mm -hmm. and what, well, how can it be a working mechanism? How does it relate to the description? 
supposed to relate to the description? I think I understand the question. How does a theory relate to a description? I really don't understand the question because there are two no. different things. It's but like then I will explain to you so that you will understand. Okay. So if I ask you, can you describe the way you form? Do you speak Swedish? Yes. Okay. The way you form questions in Swedish. Yes. Can you describe that? Yes, definitely. Do it. I, I really don't feel like doing it. I mean, it's been a, it's been a while since I... So you cannot. Okay, I'll describe no, it for I you. I can do Okay, it. but let me do it then so we get somewhere here. So you put the predicate before the subject. Yes. Basically. Springer du. Yes. Du springer, okay? So now if I want a theory, what do I have to do? I have to make a general statement. Let's say if I take the sentence, du springer, make it into a question. Springer du. Now I will say, why? I say, why? You give the answer because in Swedish you put predicate before subject when you form a question. That means you're going to a more abstract level which explains the first more concrete level. That's the general relationship between description and theory. You ask the question why and you get an explanation. Theories are there to explain what you can describe. That's why you can get a mechanism out of them. That's, that's what I said. <laughs> that's almost what you said. Can you say more non-complicated? Right. Theory is law and description is law. <laughs> theory gives you sort of specific facts about what things are like. No, no, sorry. Description does that. Description gives you specific facts about what things are like. If you want to have a general, a more general description, which in some sense summarizes and explains and falls back on some more general principle, then you get a theory. So it's essential to theory to move to something which can answer the question, why? Why is it like this? You move to some kind of principle which explains your first level. But those why questions don't have, you can actually go on. You get a, an answer to a why question. So, so if we have this, why do we move the predicate before the subject to form questions? So then you say, why? Then what, what are you going to answer then? Well, that would be another kind of answer. You could say, for example, well, it's because in Germanic languages we tend to do it that way. So then you're moving to an even more general level, out of the specific language Swedish to Germanic languages. But you can go on and ask why. So th this is the case. Theory and abstraction, there's not, a, you, there's not always a natural endpoint in either direction. You can become more dis specific in your descriptions and you can become more abstract in your explanations. But the general relation is that theory explains description. Okay. So, when do the first theories of communication appear? What do you, what's your answer? Probably in antique. When? And, um, in the ancient Greece. Ancient Greece, that's certainly one place. What other places might they have appeared? I think that we saw already on this <coughs> historical, on the wall, you can find sometimes some, some pictures that they were drawing about already. It was some sort of communication between them. Where are you talking about? This prehistoric. Uh, but where? Uh, prehistoric exists all over the world, but where, where are you located right now? Even before. But, but where? Uh, in France, maybe? In France? Yeah. yeah, there are some caves in France where you can see, uh, well, usually animals. Yeah? I think Egypt. Egypt, did that have theories of communication? No, 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 about the, the drawing. The... Yeah, but there are drawings in many places in the world. Ah. We want theories the of old. communication. <laughs> I was talking about the old one. I, I, I thought that you asked the old one. Yeah, I'm talking about old theories of communication, not drawings. They have to illustrate communication to be relevant. Yeah? Germany. Yes? Sorry? Germany. In Germany. Oh, there are some more. I'm thinking of Karl Marx. Karl Marx? Karl yeah. <laughs> Marx is not that old, you know? <laughs> 1800s? Yeah, but that's what I think. 
What? That's what I think the first few is of when we do later. That's like from the 1800s? That's not very I mean, good. Um, not the you should be about 2,000 years older. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? Yeah, there could have been theories of communication in China. Actually, they are more, as far as I know, we don't know, I don't know everything, but as far as I know, the most explicit old theories of communication do come from Greece. But there are observations relevant for communication in Egypt and in China and in India, all these places. But they're not as let's say, well-developed as the, the theories that we find in Greece. But there are certainly interesting ideas about communication in all of these places, and they're all quite old. They're all, yeah, they can be dated to before Christ, in all cases. Okay, so let's now, and what were they about? Well, we'll usually, as you will see now, they are about what one might call public speaking, how, or speaking to important and powerful powerful people. It, it could be public speaking, or they could be how should you convince the emperor of your idea, this is China, or how should you convince the pharaoh, or how should you convince, so it's usually speeches, speeches to groups of people or single individuals who are very important to convince. That That is usually the kind of ideas we find in all of these cultures. Okay, so let's go to Aristotle's rhetoric. So Aristotle was a Greek philosopher who stood on the shoulders of those who were before him. And who were before him? Well, before him were the so-called sophists. They were teachers of wisdom. Sophia is the goddess of wisdom in Old Greece. And they were teaching people how to give good speeches, especially if they were accused in court. As you know, in some of the Greek cities, they had some kind of democracy, especially in Athens. And in Athens, they had come to the stage where they, when they had a trial, when somebody was accused of a crime, that person would be judged by a group of people. And the group of people was uneven, so you did not have something that was divisible by two. There had to be always an uneven number so there could be a majority. One, one side, one group of, one subgroup of this group would think one thing and the other group would think something else. And the general idea is innocent or not, or how many, how much should you pay for this crime, or how, what, what should be your punishment. But this was very important in Greece, to be able to argue your case in front of a group that were, were acting as judges. This also, this method of argumentation was used in political decision making. This made the art of giving a speech into a very important ability in Greece. And it meant that there was a market for people who thought they were good at this and who could teach other people how to do it. And these people were called sophists. Okay, Aristotle came along and he's about 330 BC. And he listens to all of these people and what they are teaching. And he thinks, I can summarize all of this. And I can make a nice, much more, let's say, abstract and coherent description of what the sophists are teaching. And that's what he's doing in his rhetoric. Okay, and what, here are some of the two, there are two, quest, two main questions that are addressed in in the rhetoric by Aristotle. So, one is, what is a good argument which leads to truth? How can you argue in the direction of truth? Okay. The other is, how can you convince or persuade people in public speaking? Notice that these two questions don't necessarily 
harmonize with each other. Sometimes you might be able to convince people by not telling the truth. Okay, and that, that's been done several times. Now, therefore, you find in some of the Platonic dialogues, and Plato and Socrates were before Aristotle, you find a conflict between the sophists and Socrates. Socrates is always on the side of going to truth. The sophists are always saying, no, it's much more important to convince people. It doesn't make any difference if we have to lie with it. So there's this conflict. Aristotle is trying to go a middle way, saying that both are important. OK, so that means he has some ideas about the answers to both of these questions. Uh, one of the ideas, then, is the idea of syllogisms. OK, and syllogism, this is actually the first time we see some kind of uh, description of logic. And I, as I told you last time we met, logic depends to a large extent on little words like all, some, not, be. And let us see if you remember anything from last time we met. Who can give me an example of a syllogism? If only. Huh? If only. That's not a syllogism. <laughs> A syllogism, before you answer, let me tell you, a syllogism has to have premises and conclusion. Yeah? If all Swedish people are happy, I am Swedish. <laughs> okay. All Swedish people are happy, I am Swedish. Conclusion, I am happy. That's a perfect syllogism. Yes. And it relies on the word all. You have the copula R, happy. Then you have a definite person who is in the set of those who are happy. And then you, yeah, you point out that that person is you. So that, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very <coughs> nice and simple example of a syllogism. And, that, and um, Aristotle gave something like, uh, I don't remember, 10 to 15 patterns of this type that you can use to argue correctly. And during the Middle Ages, uh, people had to learn these patterns by heart. And there was a kind of list where you, Barbara, Salarant, etc., where you would go and you would know. If you learned this list, you knew all these ways of arguing. <coughs> okay. Now, another thing that uh, Aristotle came up with was the idea of topos, topoi in plural. And that is. Convenient abstract places to find arguments when you're arguing with somebody. So, one good thing is definition. So, for example, if I return to yours and my interchange here, you could say um, theory is such and such. And then I would say, give me a definition of theory. And then you would perhaps be put on the spot, perhaps not. Maybe you have a definition. But in any case, in any argument, if you want to make the other per person work a little more, you can always ask for a definition of whatever they're doing. It's, it's, a, it's a way of arguing. And then, okay, that's what's meant here. This is a place that you can bring out of your rucksack if you want to argue. Alternatively, you can say that you are unsatisfied with the definition because it's almost impossible, impossible to actually define something 100%. I hear what you say. I don't agree. <laughs> Why not? Because I have defined many terms often, and I have no problem. Yeah, but so, you have no problem with your definition. No. Other people might have. Yes, that's very good if they do. So, you know, if they have a problem, I'm going to say, can you give me a counterexample to the definition? If they can, I'm very happy. Because then I will change my definition so it becomes better. If they cannot, then I will say, let's accept my definition. Yes, but what happens when you have different opinions regarding the premises of, of something? Then you have to argue until you say, can we agree on this and this and this? And when we have agreed, then we draw the conclusions. Yes, but then you only have, you can only agree on what you actually have consensus on, obviously. I mean, That's right. if, if you have different views of how reality is, is then you have to then, work for a longer time. 
Well, or you just simply have a disagreement where... Or you have, if you give up. If, when you work for a long time and you cannot reach agreement, you, maybe you give up, I agree. <laughs> but per, first you should work for an hour or so to find agreement. <laughs> maybe you find it. Uh, okay. Uh, so we have definition. Another one is evaluation. Now you evaluate what is being said. Is it good or bad? And you ask, why do you think this way? Do you like this? So that's another thing that you can use when you're arguing. Cause and effect. You might, you know, think, what is the cause of this? And what will be the consequences? So if you are right, what will be the consequences? If I am right, what will be the consequences? What is the cause? Why are you saying this now? So questions of this type. So all of these are, you understand the whole idea. These are places you look into, you hear what the other person is saying. You think, okay, let's see. Do, do they have, do, does he or she have definitions? Let's try out. Or how do they evaluate what I'm proposing? Or what will be the consequences? So this is the kind of thing that you learn when you learn how to argue argumentation analysis, when you learn how to do rhetoric, etc. Then Aristotle, similarly, this is somewhat similar to this, he came up with categories categories of understanding. So Aristotle came up with 10 categories of understanding. So these are um, ways in which we can make claims about reality. So we can, this, in a, another way of saying it is, this, these are ways in which subject and predicate can be related. So we can make claims about substance, we can make quantity claims, so I can say, in this room there are now more than 90 people. I might be wrong, I, might, I haven't counted you, so I don't know. But that would be an example of a quantitative claim. Or if we want quality, in this room there are now more than 90 excellent students. <laughs> that would be a quality related claim. Or uh, relation. In this room, there are people uh, who uh, are interested in learning more about communication. That is your relation to communication, your strive to learn more. Uh, in this, yeah, you can see, I can make claims about the place. We're, we're in Gothenburg right now. The time is 2 o'clock. Position, state, actually, you understand? These are types of claims that we can make. So he made a classification of what kind of claims can occur in arguments. So you see that this is sort of an abstract description. It's not really a theory, I would say, because he, well, sometimes it comes close to a theory, but it's an abstract description. But there are no real principles explaining what's going on. <clears throat> then he had something called practical syllogisms. Okay, so up here we have what might one might call theoretical syllogisms. Here, how do we reason if we want people to act or if I myself want to act? So let's say um, there is an apple on the table. I like apples. How can I now take the step to picking up the apple and eat it? If I say, there are apples on the table, I like apples. That's not a syllogism in the first sense. Because it doesn't follow logically that I should pick up the apple and eat it. But given a theory about human beings, how they let their tastes rule their actions, etc., you might now say it's likely that the person will now pick up the apple and eat it. So practical syllogisms are they're not real logical syllogisms, they're more probable things that might happen if, you, if this and this and this is the case, then probably this kind of action will happen. Right, and then finally, there is the concept of enthymeme. That is also a kind of a widening of the notion of a syllogism. This, this, that, these are things that people tend to believe. They are plausible, but they are not logically valid arguments. So, for example, in Sweden, a lot of people believe that when a specific tree, the Roven tree, in Swedish, Rönnberg, 
Have you ever seen, have you seen this tree? It's a tree which has bright red berries. Orange. Orange. You know the tree? No. Yeah. So a lot of Swedes believe that if those, if there are lots of those berries, and that they are brightly colored, that's a sign of a cold winter coming up. Okay? And so now we have lots of those berries, and so if you believe this, then that's a sign of a cold winter coming up. <laughs> okay, this, this would be something that doesn't follow logically at all, not even scientifically probably. But it's something that a lot of people believe. That's an enthymeme. So, if, you know, I'll, I'll say, uh, the winter looks like it's going to be cold, and people will say, why do you say that? Ah, the Roman berries are very red, and there are many of them. That's an enthymeme. And that, that's the kind of uh, argument that a lot of people will use. And you can, of course, challenge them down, because you can say it's not a syllogism, it's not, maybe it doesn't, as I said, maybe it's not even backed up by science. So you think. But it's still used. Okay, so you can all see how these are useful concepts to describe what people might do in arguing and trying to convince other people about their ideas. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah. I mean, the, the enthymemes, yeah. if they are scientifically backed, do they, do they become indicators then? If they are? If they are scientifically backed, do they become indicators then? Indicators of what? Well, I don't know. Indicators of whatever you're trying to... Well, they become indicators of the fact that you know science. <laughs> well, no, not really. I mean, uh, for example, in social sciences, you try usually to find a lot of indicators for, well, different things. Yeah. Say how stable a government is and so on. Or yeah. uh, see how, how well a policy works and, right. and so on. And then you obviously try to find indicators that, that somehow... So then you have a theory you know, about certain signs of certain other properties. <coughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah. Now, that would be enthymemes which are, let's say, more than just conventional ideas. They, they see, what you're saying seems to be backed up by some systematic evidence and so on. Well, there usually is a correlation or yeah. even causation. So that, that, that would be moving out of just being an enthymeme into a more a tentative hypothesis generalization based on based on some evidence. So if the, if we say an enthymeme is backed by empirical evidence, then it becomes more than an enthymeme. Yeah. You could still say in a wide sense that well it's an enthymeme backed by by scientific evidence. But maybe there are other words that might be better, like a generalization or I don't know, empirical hypothesis or yeah. So, I mean, Aristotle also has other things to say, for example, about deduction and induction, but I was not planning to tell you about everything today. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can, before we take a break, finish Aristotle at least. So, Aristotle also had another idea. So, he said there are three aspects when you have public speaking, three basic aspects that uh, you should pay attention to uh, in giving your talk. There should be logos, ethos, and pathos, or pathos. There are two ways of pronouncing that. Uh, so logos means that you should represent reason, and you should represent re reality in a truthful way. Should be, yeah, should be logical, you might say. But that's not enough. You can be representing reason and logic, but you can be very boring. You can be, uh, you know, you can act in such a way, way that people don't want to listen to you, or they don't trust you, because you're doing strange things when you talk and so on. So you have to establish not only logos, you also have to establish ethos. And ethos has Several aspects, but a very basic aspect of ethos is trust, establishing trust. You must do things in such a way that people trust you. Okay? So establish trust some way. Make, make people believe what you're saying. Then present what you have to say in a logical way. Now the final thing, pathos or pathos, it's very often you want, pe you want to convince people to do something. And they're not going to do something unless you get their emotions involved. They have to feel inspired. They have to feel enthusiastic. 
You have to feel things like that. Now, if you can do that, that's using pathos or pathos. So you evoke emotions in people. Or, you know, you could use a different uh, technique. You could try to scare them. If you don't do this, I'll shoot you. <laughs> that, that would also be pathos, yeah? I was just wondering, you know when you say ethos of establishing trust? Yeah. I was wondering if that correlates straight to linguistics, or can, can you say that I'm dressed in a certain way, or I'm doing certain gestures, and I'm establishing trust that way? Okay, so I'm a professor. If I came in in an even sloppier dress than I have today, I at least have a coat now, right? I could have come in more like you. I don't know, I'm wearing shorts. Do you wear shorts? I'm not wearing shorts. I'm no, but a, a t-shirt with shorts which were, that had spots on them and so on. Yeah. That could have been something that made you trust me less. Let's say I also had uh, you know, unwashed hair and uh, I was a bit dirty and so on. All of this would make it hard for me to make you trust me. So clothes are, are an important uh, part of building up ethos, for sure. But clothes are not the only thing. You, of course, you also have to say something that is worthwhile at all. But it's the whole thing. Now, you cannot just say it's, it's the uh, linguistic part. It's, yeah, you're, whatever you're communicating through your whole appearance. Yeah. So clothes are, are, are an interesting and important part of, of public speech here. Should not be neglected. Okay, <clears throat> so you have to know what the conventions are here. Some of you come from countries, let me guess you, you come from a country where professors wear suits and ties every day? Yeah. yeah. So you think I'm sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> but some of you come from countries, who comes from America? Anybody come from America? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, you would have a lot of professors wearing t-shirts and jeans, right? Depends. Depends on where you're from. Where are you from? If you came here from Canada, Toronto. Maybe they're more formal in Canada than in the United States. It depends States. on college or university. Yeah, it does. But anyway, you know, I, I have lived in the United States for quite some time, so no, there, you're right, it depends. But there are certainly many places in the United States where people could be very sloppily dressed. And I would actually now be dressed nicely, with, with coming from that background. And also in a Swedish context, wearing a coat is actually uh, somewhat more formal. Look at the other guys who are professors here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So it's the whole thing. The whole package. But it's relative to the cultural circumstances where you are or where you're working. So what is sloppy in one place could be more formal and nice in another place. <laughs> Right. Okay. Let let I think we need a little break. We'll have a little break. Yep. many of the ideas that were uh, uh, common in Greece and Rome. But there is another person who, in a sense, summarized what happened after Aristotle. And Aristotle was working 300 years BC. Quintilian was working, I don't know, three, 400 years AD. So we're talking six, 700 years later. But during this whole period, in Greece and Rome, people have been teaching and discussing about communication, especially the aspects we call rhetoric. Now, Quintilian summarized a lot of the things that were in Aristotle's rhetoric, uh, but he also added a few things himself. Now, 
one of the things is a list of, uh, let's say, things you should bear in mind that are relevant when you are, want to make a speech. So the first thing is inventio. So that's what are you going to talk about? What's going, what's going to be the topic? What arguments are you going to use? And here, what Aristotle called logos becomes important. What ideas do you have? How do they follow from each other? What are the consequences, etc.? What topics? And now you can use Aristotle's theory of top point, places to find arguments, and you can pull them out when you invent your, your speech. Now, as you go along with that, you start to arranging it in better and better order. That's called dispositio. So you make a, you make a plan for what you're going to say. Sometimes in English it's called arrangement, but plan is just a good word also. And now you have to plan in, come in, come in. So you invent your topic that you're going to talk about, then you make a plan for what the talk is going to be like. And the parts you have here after this positio, exordium, narratio, partitio, confirmatio, conclusio, these are parts that your talk could contain. It doesn't necessarily have to contain all of them, but very often good talks actually do contain all of them. Like it can contain all of them or it can contain some of them. So the exordium is the start of the talk. And here it's especially important to establish trust. So ethos, that's why I have ethos in red there. Then you give a story, you tell the audience how you have uh, structured your talk, patitio. Then you give some uh, arguments <coughs> that support whatever you're arguing for, confirmatio. And then finally you come to some kind of conclusion. So that, that's the actual plan of the talk. Now, the third aspect you also have to consider is how you should do it. The elocution, if you like, elocutio. Um, what, what kind of linguistic devices should you use? Should you use metaphors, metonyms? Should you use proverbs? Well, that's kind of questions. And these, that choice is often dictated by what emotional effects you want to achieve in your audience. So here's where pathos comes in. You want to evoke certain emotions. 10 minutes is 10 minutes, my friends. Okay. And then memoria. Well, that's very important. You, in antiquity, you did, were not allowed to cheat the way I'm cheating. I have this PowerPoint presentation which helps my memory. <coughs> but in antiquity, no, that was not allowed. You had to memorize the speech. So you had to remember. If you want to talk for half an hour, an hour, you have to remember it. So we're always part of, of your speech training was to train your memory. And so they developed different tricks to help your memory. One trick was to have the uh, model of the house. So you think of your talk as a house with different rooms in it. So first you come into the porch maybe, then you come into the living room, then you come into the kitchen, etc. And in each room, you put part of your talk. So when you're up there giving your talk, you think, okay, now I have to step into the house. What's going to come to me first? Now I have to step into the living room. What do I have to say? <laughs> so you could relate the parts of the dispositio to parts of a house. There are, there are also other ways of doing this, but this was a very um, clever way of trying to help people remember what they were going to say. This, and, and there was a lot of training when you were 
trained in speech making, you were trained in memorizing the speech and well, giving it in a good way. And the last thing then was like the final polish on how you're going to do it. Pronuncia, the action, delivery. And here, body language comes in. What should you do? Should you do what I do? Walk around the room. And Stefano tells me, don't do that. It's <laughs> difficult to capture on the film. <laughs> or, uh, you know, should you gesture like this? Or should, how should you use your voice? What should you do? So that, that was also part of the parcel. So you can see that this is, it's a fairly complete idea about how to give speeches. Already present 2,000 years ago. That's why I said that these theories are not old fashioned that we can throw away. They are still quite useful. Okay. <coughs> so what happened after antiquity? Question to you. <coughs> Sorry? Speak louder. Once more, I couldn't hear you. Okay, anybody else? Yes? Maybe, like in antiquity, antiquity, the focus was more on the spoken language and like elaborating the speech in a way that he began, he um, like suggested. Yeah. And then later on, the focus maybe moved more on the written communication, and it was more important to be able to write properly to monks and stuff like where they elaborated their like the written skills. Yes, you are actually right. There is more emphasis on the written word and written communication. That's true. Uh, so that, that happens. And actually, coming back to spoken language and so on, has really only happened in the last 50 years. There's been a long period in between where the main focus was written language. Actually, that's a, it's a nice way of putting it. So in antiquity, we had a lot of focus on spoken language. Then we had almost 2,000 years of focus on written language, and now we're coming back to spoken language and nonverbal communication, etc. Things like that. Yes? So that, that is one way of answering the question what happened after antiquity? Can we have any other answers? Yes, you have another one. So that was, uh, like a long time, everything fell apart. And then it took them a couple of hundred years to like focus on communication again. Yeah. Okay, so you're talking about the so-called Dark Ages, yeah. when the Germanic tribes came down and took Rome, and uh, <laughs> there was not so much learning and teaching and so on. So it took them up until the me medieval period. <coughs> when the first universities are starting in Europe, it's in the, well, around the year 1000, in Italy mainly and then spreading to other countries. So that's the European scene, okay. But then at the same time, we have other stories to tell about India and China and so on, where, where the development is slightly different. So actually, we, we can see that there are maybe three major centers of learning going very far back, Europe, India, China. Then we have one which sort of stopped, which was Egypt. And then we have Egypt coming back again after the advent of Islam and having a, a period of uh, great activity, especially in the Middle Ages. So, but that, that, those are the main cultural centers perhaps where, where, where you have people writing about communication and about rhetoric and so on. Okay, let's look now, I will go back a little to so one theory we haven't talked about so far, but which has been very important to, for the understanding of language and communication, is a theory that sometimes is called semiotics. And you might say that semiotics is, another word for that might be to call it sign, sign theories, theories of signs. And there were, in fact, sign theories already back in antiquity. And perhaps the most developed one was developed by the school of philosophy called the Stoics. The Stoics are actually somewhat similar to the Buddhists. So they believe that if you cultivate the right attitude of mind and so on, then even if people are 
crazy around you, you can keep your own calm, <laughs> you can be. And there was a Roman emperor who was a Stoic, Mar Mar Marcus Aurelius. And he wrote books about how you could keep your calm as an emperor, even when you were uh, in battle. Okay, anyway, they had a, a fairly rich and elaborated uh, system of philosophy, and part of this was their semiotic theory. And they had a sign as a three-place relation. So what is this? Let's take an example. In English, this object is called what? No, it's not called a chair. It's called a stool. Okay? S-T-O-O-L. Okay, so if you have the word stool, let's write it here on the whiteboard. Stool. It can be seen in three ways. There is the word, that's what we have there on the whiteboard, which in the Stoic theory was called semino, the signifier. There is the object, which he called the referent. This is the object. Yeah. And then there is the concept. And what's that? Can you all see this? Yeah. Close your eyes. Imagine it. Mental object, mental representation, concept. Okay? So, so it's pointed out we need all three. We need an object in the world, we need something carrying the information, and we need some concept. And other words for this that are often used, signified, and sometimes signified can be used either for this, for one of these two. Sometimes it's used for both of these two. And as we'll see, some theories did not have three, only two. But in the Stoic theory, there were three things. So, and this theory then existed already in the first centuries uh, AD. And when we come up to the medieval period, so now we're talking in 1300, 1400, there is a medieval philosopher in England called William of Ockham, who said, we can make this simpler. We don't need to have three things. Actually, this theory had already come before. We really only have need to have two. We can have the word, and we can have the object. Because the word in itself, Ockham and other people said, carries with it some kind of sense of meaning. <coughs> so if you have this view, this was called nominalism, because you only needed the name. You don't need the concept. Now, other people were saying that, in fact, that's wrong. You also need the concept. So they were called conceptualists. Okay? So you had a, in the medieval period in Europe, you had a debate between nominalists and conceptualists. And if we go back to antiquity, there was a third position which was advocated by Plato and Socrates. That is that actually the most important thing about the word stool is not this object, but it is an abstract object in the world of ideas, the perfect stool, outside of time and space. And in fact, all words really denote the perfect ideas in this abstract space. If you believe that, you're called a realist. So you wonder, how can you call those people realists? It seems the opposite of realism. Well, it's because you have to think of this as conceptual realism. They think that the concepts are real. They don't come from things in the world. In fact, the things in the world are just weak <coughs> versions of what you have in the world of ideas. That's, that's the platonic view. Okay, so these are three theories of meaning. Conceptual realism and mental conceptualism, you might say, and then giving language a very strong role 
nominalism. These three theories of meaning are still with us today. So when you read things which are more philosophical and so on in communication studies, people will say, this is a realist view, or this is a nominalist view, or this is a conceptualist view, and that is what is meant. Okay, in the medieval period, there was another theory, which also is with us still today, in some form. And that's the theory of modes of signification, modi significandi, encapsulated in the so-called speculative grammar. And the word speculative here means mirror. So it's the mirroring grammar. And let me give you an example to show you how this works. If you look at language, and we had that last time, you had nouns, verbs, adjectives, etc. So what can we say about nouns? Nouns are words like table, chair, etc. What do they usually stand for? What do they usually denote? What do they usually refer to? Anybody? To the things that we sense. Things. Right. They denote things. So, the mode of signification of nouns corresponds to a category in the world. In the, in the Aristotelian, remember you had ten categories? In the Aristotelian category scheme, this would be substances. Things and substances. And now you have to have a mental operation which links language to the world. And that would be the mental act of reification, making something into a thing. Okay? If you take a verb, verb, run, sing, this would correspond to processes or actions. And then again, you would have some kind of mental process which allows you to make up actions, to see something as a process. Okay? If you take something like red or blue adjectives, this corresponds to properties in the Aristotelian scheme. And again, you need a mental operation which allows you to pick out properties of things in the world, property abstraction. So this is the way this theory works. You have three modes. Mode, you have the linguistic mode, you have the psychological mode, which is called modi intelligendi, and then you have the mode of being, modi essendi. So thing, briefication, noun. Process, seeing something as a process, verb. Do you get this? No? Who, how, who gets it? Two people. Okay, well, we have to do it once more. You seem to be getting it. Tell the class. Me? Yes, you look like you're getting it. I'm trying my best. <laughs> well, it uh, is like uh, if we have... Uh, some object like was the chair, this yeah. is the thing. If we have some verb that it is a process, yeah. and if it's some adjective like some color or something, it is a property. Yes. And if we have a preposition like in or on, it's a relation. Yes. Yes. So it's almost what I taught you last time. I mean, with that, in, in this logical analysis, we still use these ideas. So it's a correspondence. It's a mirroring between things in the world, ways of thinking, and ways of using language. So it's three things which are corresponding to each other, mirroring each other. That's why it's called speculative, because speculum means mirror in Latin. Yeah. Are there more people who are getting it now? Yes. A few more. This is an abstract, fairly abstract theory. But it's interesting to see that they had this theory already in the medieval period. Okay, and then you find in the, in the intellectual history that these theories get written down in books and some people learn them and then they forget them. So they have to be reinvented and that's what happened to some of these medieval theories because they were written in Latin. And when we come to the 1500s, people stopped using Latin as much as they had done before. 
and they started writing in the various vernacular languages of Europe, like German, English, etc. So they didn't always know that these theories existed. So when we get to the 1600s, here is a guy, John Locke, English philosopher, so he was quite famous in political science and so on. And uh, well, he then has to rediscover <laughs> semiotics, which actually already did, existed since antiquity. And he now, you know, says this is very important. We have to study signs and how they work, etc. Okay. So here is probably the person who has. Today is usually referred to when you talk about semiotics, and that's Charles Sanders Peirce. He was an American philosopher who lived between, I don't know, 1850 and 1910 or so. I'm not sure exactly, but something like that. So yeah, late 1800s, early 1900s. He's the founder of the School of American Philosophy, which is sometimes called pragmatism. Very important for American philosophy. And he was very interested in semiotics and how to develop this theory. He came up with a new angle on this, which had not really existed in the medieval period or in antiquity. He was interested in the problem of how we can carry information, how we can share information. In what ways can a word like stool or whatever, anything, carry information to another person. He said, there are only three ways. These are the three ways. It can be done through contiguity, closeness, proximity. So if I'm pointing, look at me now. My finger, this is an index finger, it's pointing to the stool. So the fact that it is close to the stool means that it can carry your attention to the stool, and that means it can carry information about the stool to you. That's the first one, index. Now he said, in fact, closeness is also what is behind <coughs> cause and effect. The cause is close to the effect. So you have thunder and lightning. Okay, so thunder can be a sign that there will be lightning. Or you have clouds, gray skies, gray clouds on the sky. This is a sign that there will be rain. So closeness in time and space, also index. Okay, that's one way. Through, through a relation of contiguity or closeness. Second way, I show you a picture of something. That picture carries information about what it is picturing. That is similarity. So the thing you are using to carry information is similar to what the information is that you want to convey. And the third thing is what we're using in the word stool here. It's an arbitrary convention. People speaking a language have agreed when they speak English that the word stool can be used to carry information about this kind of objects. That he called symbol. So then he used these three words, index for contiguity, icon, that's the Greek word for picture, and symbol, which he used for, for this. So normally all the words in a language are symbols. So language is basically symbolic, while art is iconic, and nature is basically indexical. Okay, this is philosophy, so you know communication studies are not completely free of philosophy. Sometimes you have to think a little more deeply. Try to understand these things because they are basic. And symbol is what? I'm sorry. It's when a sign carries information by arbitrary convention. You look troubled. What is it that you don't understand in that? No, this is, I just lost like index is to NATO and the icon was a supporter and the symbol. Like the word stool or any word. For any word. Any word. Oh, any no. linguistic word is a symbol. No, there's no this could just as well be called something else. What's your language? Swedish. 
Uh, in Swedish, is it called what? Hall. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, it <laughs> could be called stool or it could be called hall. And in your language? Huh? Luganda. Luganda. That's your language, but what's this called? Mesa. Mesa. That's the Spanish word for table. Interesting. <laughs> yeah? But is it a symbol because... Society agreed. Louder. Is it is it a symbol because society agreed that it's a symbol? Because what? Society agreed that it's a symbol. Agreed in some metaphorical sense. Because they started to do the same things. They didn't sit down and actually at a table and agree on it. Yes. But the way I'm thinking about it is that you take that store and take it to some sort of faraway tribe or some sort of yeah. culture. Yeah. They will look at it and probably cut it up and... They have never seen it before. Them. And you say, in my language we call it stool. And since they don't have a, a word, they will also start to call it stool. And this is done first by the chief. And since everybody wants to be friends with the chief, they talk like him. That's the sense of agreement we have, right? It doesn't mean that you have to sit down and formally agree on anything. It means that you just mimic other people for some reason. And usually, it basically the reason is that you want to share information. Okay? So it's not an agreement in the sense of calling everybody up and say, let's call this <laughs> Not like that. Okay. <clears throat> right. So, since index is, in a sense, the most natural thing here, it's in a sense, it's underneath icon and symbol. Since we need to have, we need to be able to see the word stool over there. And that involves causal processes, optical energy being transferred. Or if we have a picture, we need to see the picture. So that also involves causal processes. That's why I wrote here, index is also a fundamental aspect of icon and symbol. Index is in some sense the most fundamental here. And another thing to, to notice is that the three types of representation are not necessarily mutually exclusive. So you can have, for example, an iconic symbol. Who can think of an iconic symbol? The stop sign. Why is that iconic? Because it's a stop sign. <laughs> <laughs> not good enough. <laughs> no? Awareness, alert. What? The red color? Yeah. <coughs> the red color makes you stop? If that is true, then it's indexical rather than iconic. Because it's a cause effect relation. Right. But that would be an indexical symbol. If it's true that you naturally stop, I don't know if it's true. But, but what about iconic symbol? Where you use similarity as well as convention, yeah? Yeah, well, maybe the other signs of, uh, like, for example, two cars, uh, well, you are not allowed to pass the other car to see. You have a car with a line over it? Yeah, I mean like one car is black, the other car is red. Right. And you are not that's allowed right. to... Very good. That's exactly, that's an iconic symbol. Because you can see the pictures of the car, so you know what's... And then you have a symbolic part with the line over it. So, yeah, that's good. <coughs> or if I say... Meow! <laughs> that's another iconic symbol. Because cats don't sound the same in all languages. You're aware of that? Yeah. Right. In your language, how do cats sound? Same. Any body speak a language where they don't sound like what I just said? You all sound like that? Your language. No, what do you mean? Yeah? Japanese is nyang. That's a bit different. <laughs> Actually, dogs are a better example because they are more different. But all those are iconic, so you can combine them, okay? Yeah? Now here is another person who has been working on semiotics and classifying language and so on from the point of view of semiotics. This time it's a man called Charles Morris who was working at the University of Chicago in the 1920s and 30s. And he said he wanted to talk about sign systems and language. Natural language is a sign system. Uh, and you can classify or you can look at all sign systems from three points of views. Three points of view. 
and he called them syntax, semantics, pragmatics. Syntax, you only look at the sign system in terms of the signs themselves, without only the signifier, so the word stool, without thinking of the meaning. Semantics, you bring in what is being signified. And so then you get yeah, signifier plus signified. We talked about this last time I talked to you also. So you should have a little memory flashing. I've heard this before. I hope you look like you've heard it before. Good. And the third thing was pragmatics. How are the signs used in context? And you're going to see these words a lot of times throughout your studies. <coughs> Syntax, semantics, pragmatics. They are commonly used in many, many aspects of communication studies today. <coughs> okay? And you can also, I wrote up there, any sign has a signifier and signified. And we saw in the Stoic theory that they actually had two kinds of signifiers, or signifieds. They had the concept and they had the actual object. But not all theories have three things. Many theories only have two. So they have a word, a sound, or whatever it is, a written symbol, and then the meaning of that symbol. Okay? And now we'll come to another theory which is related to this. And it's the theory of the uh, French Swiss linguist uh, Ferdinand de Saussure and he only had two as distinct from the Stokes. Here is another case of somebody who is reinventing the wheel. And all this semiotics has been invented now for 2,000 years by John Locke and here's Ferdinand de Saussure, Charles Sanders Peirce, they're all reinventing the wheel. They all have slightly different terminology. In the case of Saussure, he now has two, signifié et signifiant. <coughs> he also called the whole business semiology rather than semiotics. <coughs> okay, so if you read French, is there, I don't remember anybody from France here, you'll see in France that this is often called semiologie mm -hmm. instead of semiotique. <laughs> And also maybe sometimes in Italian and Spanish because they've been influenced by French. <coughs> yeah. And his, so uh, he, he wrote a major work on the nature of language, which for him was a system of arbitrary science. This is a term he uses a lot. Language as a system of arbitrary science. Um, and that, if, if we use the terminology of purse, that would mean that language consists of a system of symbols. Arbitrary science. But uh, unfortunately, Saussure did not use the word symbol for this, but he used it in a different sense. This is one of the problems when you're studying theories of communication. Different authors are using the words in slightly different senses. And now you have to sit down and think about what, how is this person really defining this concept here? And you can see that sometimes they are different. That's the case with the word symbol, which has one use in the Persian English tradition and another use in the French tradition, where it actually is more close to icon and index. You look. You can come back to me next time you meet, and you can study if I'm right or wrong. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. But semiotics is still alive, and there are it's a well, it's a well uh, growing branch of linguistics and communication studies. There's a, a semiotic society, and people are studying many different things. Uh, here are two people who. Uh, have been working in the last 50 years. There is Umberto Eco, have you heard of him? Yes. Yeah, he's also an author, Italian, and he has written novels where uh, semiotics plays a big role. He often has people chasing after strange things under <laughs> many different strange names. So, but he's, he's very interested in semiotics and he wants to illustrate problems of semiotics by sometimes writing novels to show what the problems are. 
and it tries to uh, unite semiotics, culture, and communication in his uh, work. Another person is the uh, English uh, linguist Michael Halliday, who uh, uh, moved to Australia and he started his own school of linguistics. And he talks a lot about social semiotics. And he has written a book called Social Semiotics, where he tries to show how that's more fundamental than language itself. Okay. Michael Halliday and Umberto Eco are still alive, so now we're in 2013. So we arrived all the way now from, uh, what was it, 500 BC to 2013. Okay, but we're going to go back a little again because there are many things we haven't said. Okay, so here's a question that will be the last thing we discussed today. That is, what is the relation between linguistics, semiotics, and theory of communication? Anybody want to answer? Are they the same thing? No. No? Nope. What's they the difference? Each other. They are including each other. Or all including each yeah. uh, other. Theory of the community, yeah, in some way. <laughs> Is there any, any of these terms, linguistic, semiotics, or communication, do they all, are they, let's make a picture here on the blackboard. Where did I put the yeah. whiteboard? Are they like this? No. no. Linguistic is a bigger circle. Okay, so it, are they like this? This is the biggest circle, and here's a smaller circle, and there is a small. <laughs> are they like this? No. What are they like then? That's not an easy question, actually. <laughs> not an easy question. So here we have linguistics, here we have communication, and here we have over semiotics. Is that the right picture? Is this the right picture? Is another picture which is the right picture? Yeah? yeah isn't it in a sense uh, like the uh, differentiation that you have between uh, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics? No, that, that I can tell you right away is this picture. Isn't that uh, like in semiotics you don't have like, pragmatics? But in the theory of communication, you have the pragmatics in semiotic semantics. Now, semantics and <coughs> linguistics, we are dealing with syntax, more or less. I mean, both the people in semiotics and the people in linguistics would violently disagree with that. Yeah. I, I mean, it's completely true that that communication would cover all three, but a lot of linguists think of themselves as doing pragmatics, <laughs> semantics, and so on. So that, no, it's not, you cannot say that linguistics only does syntax. Only some linguists say that, but they are a minority. Semiotics, you might say that they only do syntax and semantics, but again, there are semioticians who say, no, we do pragmatics too. So it, it, it's hard. I think, you know, if I, I'm not sure, I haven't made up my own mind on this question, I can tell you right now. I think I'm more inclined to this picture than to this picture. But it might be that they shouldn't be equal, maybe, you know, it should be bigger in some direction, and sometimes there's only a small part outside, etc. Yeah? Maybe, it's, uh, I think, maybe communication, semiotic and linguistic, they can uh, mm, combine each other, but communication, uh, semiotic linguistics, they have to be in, uh, completely in communication. I so you, you would like, how can we do that? You would like uh, something like this? Yeah, something like that. So they're I all think. in communication, but then they are slightly different in size. I mean, can, can, you, can you take off the communication from a semiotic and linguistic? I don't know, I don't think so. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I leave it to you. Debate this with own your own, in your own mind. So when you wake up, you know, early in the morning and you cannot sleep, <laughs> this is what you should be thinking about. We'll see you in about eight days. Thank you. Thank you.